there's a special link between creativity and emotion. It's actually known that many of history's great creative minds often suffer from things like depression or bipolar disorder. So, the question we naturally have to ask is, do these emotional challenges make an artist more creative? For instance, is there some unique neural wiring in depression that opens the door to free-flowing creativity? Or is the correlation more obvious? Maybe the artist finds something therapeutic in those moments of creativity, and that's why some people who suffer from depression spend more time being creative. They can perhaps safely explore their emotional world and even find relief from their suffering through their self-expression. Perhaps it's both. In our last episode, we explored the creative genius of Leonardo da Vinci. Every one of his works is an example of technical mastery, intellectual brilliance. But does he ever open up to us? Do we ever get a glimpse of his internal struggles and emotions? Surprisingly not. But we know that creativity is deeply linked with emotion. For example, people with bipolar disorder often have moments of intense creative impulses. And for many people, life's tragedies and heartbreaks often create a complexity of emotions that can only be resolved or understood through creating art. Personal works. I know I've experienced that in my own life. And that certainly holds true. And that's the subject of today's episode, when pain becomes art. And who could serve us as a better guide through this challenging landscape than one of the most iconic artists of the 20th century, Frida Kahlo. This is Creative Codex. I am your host, MJ Dorian. Let's take a journey into the rich inner world of Frida and see what she teaches us about ourselves. In the immense landscape of 20th century art, Frida Kahlo's paintings stand out, partially because of Frida's unrelenting focus on one subject, herself. She officially painted 55 self-portraits, which means she often painted at least two self-portraits per year, sometimes more. And as you read her journals and biography, you begin to see how intimately each portrait coincides with something in her personal life in the months surrounding each painting. They're all deeply personal works, like a visual journal, each with the remarkable gaze of Frida's eyes staring into you. A stare which manages to draw you in and push you away at the same time. A stare that is somehow both a challenge and an invitation. Today, we're taking a deep dive into two of Frida's paintings. Two paintings which speak volumes about the woman, the artist, and the icon. Part 1. The Broken Column Any attempt to understand Frida's emotional world must begin with the accident. It's unavoidable. If Frida Kahlo was a superhero, then the accident is her origin story. It defined the struggles that would affect the rest of her life, but it also called forth from her an unshakable willpower and a thirst for life that has continued to inspire everyone who reads her story. Frida was 18 years old when she was on a bus with her boyfriend of the time, Alejandro Gomez Arias. The bus was full of rush hour passengers when, without warning, a trolley car crashed into the side of the bus, causing a catastrophe 
that resulted in several people dying and countless injuries of passengers. What follows is the account of the accident given by her friend Alejandro. The electric train with two cars approached the bus slowly. It hit the bus in the middle. Slowly the train pushed the bus. The bus had a strange elasticity. It bent more and more. But for a time it did not break. It was a bus with long benches on either side. I remember that at one moment my knees touched the knees of the person sitting opposite me. I was sitting next to Frida. When the bus reached its maximal flexibility, it burst into a thousand pieces. And the train kept moving. It ran over many people. I remained under the train, not Frida. But among the iron rods of the train, the handrail broke and went through Frida, from one side to the other at the level of the pelvis. When I was able to stand up, I got out from under the train. I had no lesions, only contusions. Naturally, the first thing I did was to look for Frida. Something strange had happened. Frida was totally nude. The collision had unfastened her clothes. Someone in the bus, probably a house painter, had been carrying a packet of powdered gold. This package broke, and the gold fell all over the bleeding body of Frida. When people saw her, they cried, La bailarina, la bailarina. With the gold on her red, bloody body, they thought she was a dancer. In the confusion, I picked her up, and then I noticed with horror that Frida had a piece of iron in her body. A man said, we have to take it out. He put his knee on Frida's body and said, let's take it out. When we pulled it out, Frida screamed so loud that when the ambulance from the Red Cross arrived, her screaming was louder than the siren. Before the ambulance came, I picked up Frida and put her in the display window of a billiard room. I took off my coat and put it over her. I thought she was going to die. Two or three people did die at the scene. Others died later. The ambulance came and took her to the Red Cross Hospital, which in those days was on San Geronimo Street, a few blocks from where the accident took place. Frida's condition was so grave that the doctors did not think they could save her. They thought she would die on the operating table. Frida was operated on for the first time. During the first month, it was not certain that she would live. The injuries that Frida sustained from this accident, they plagued her for the rest of her life. They would improve for a few months and then plunge her back into unbearable pain over the years, resulting in dozens of surgeries. Frida later said, it was a strange collision it was not violent, but rather silent, slow, and it harmed everybody, and me most of all. Her spinal column was broken in three places. Her collarbone was broken, as were her third and fourth ribs. Her right leg had eleven fractures, and her right foot was dislocated and crushed. Her left shoulder was out of joint, and her pelvis broken in three places. The steel handrail mentioned by Alejandro had literally skewered her body at the level of her abdomen, entering on the left side and exiting through her vagina. When Frida was older, in her trademark dark humor, she would say that the accident stole her virginity. With this serious list of injuries, it's no wonder even her family feared she wasn't going to survive. She was 18 at the time of the accident, about to begin rigorous studies in college, which now had to be put on hold. For the first month, Frida lay flat on her back in the hospital, encased in a plaster cast, and enclosed in a box-like structure that looked like a sarcophagus. Frida later wrote, I never thought of painting until 1926, when I was in bed on account of an automobile accident. I was bored as hell in bed with a plaster cast. I had a fracture in the spine and several in other places, so I decided to do something. 
I stole from my father some oil paints, and my mother ordered me a special easel because I couldn't sit up, and I started to paint. And this became one of Frida's most common workspaces. Whenever her health was in ruin and she was confined to a room, she would paint. In 1944, she painted a self-portrait called The Broken Column. It's a painting with striking urgency that holds your attention like few others by any artist. In it, we see Frida standing before us with her steely gaze but this time with tears flowing from her eyes. Her nude body is bound by what appears to be a white cage, which was one of the metal corsets she was required to wear to help her spine recover. She stands in a landscape of barren cliffs. But the most unnerving detail is the chasm that splits her own body in half. The massive crack in her flesh runs from her pelvis, between her naked breasts and under her chin. Within the chasm is seen a classic Greek column, riddled with cracks and missing bits, crumbling under its own weight. It no doubt represents her own spine, which was broken in three places. As you examine the painting a bit longer, you begin to notice what look like acupuncture needles all over her body. But on closer inspection, These are steel nails. It's a recurring motif in her paintings that symbolizes pain. In her hands, she grasps a white shroud as it is falling, revealing her naked body to us, as if we are witnessing this moment frozen in time. If you have ever doubted the ability of art to elicit emotion, look at this painting. There are few paintings that hit you with the clarity and immediacy that this one does. There are often three planes of reality in Frida's paintings. The physical, the emotional, and the cultural. In The Broken Column, the initial impact of the symbolism is the physical. But as the image sinks into your unconscious, you can't help but feel something. There's more than pain being expressed. You feel the isolation of the barren landscape, the steel resolve of Frida's piercing eyes calling up defiance, as if to face down this insurmountable pain and tragedy. And then there is the stark contrast of Frida's gentle body, the subtle appearance of weight to her breasts, which makes the chasm and the crumbling column appear that much more of a violation, an injustice, the cruelty of fate. Perhaps the emotion Frida was expressing was the edge of her own despair. The image takes on the aura of a martyr or a saint, like a female Saint Sebastian. And this may be the unintended universality of Frida's portraits, and why they are so beloved around the world. There is an iconography to them. In these symbolic representations, she does become a symbol, a symbol of the sublimation of pain. Much like the religious iconography in countless churches throughout Mexico, which Frida would have been very familiar with. We can find certain relief from our pain by expressing it through art, whether it's physical or emotional. And in that moment, pain becomes art. Part two, the two Fridas. Have you ever been in love? The kind of relationship that stretches beyond a year or two, the kind of relationship in which you grow together and you see each other in your best and your worst moments, and yet you still feel the desire to be with each other, to grow together. This feeling of love when it seems like this other person truly completes you, and it makes you wonder who you were before you met them. Well, 
Have you ever then had your heart broken? It can feel like complete chaos, a pit of despair. You lose your sense of reality in that bitter separation, especially if you are on the receiving end, and it was your partner, your lover, who either betrayed you or decided it would be best to split apart. It's one of the worst feelings in the world. It kind of makes sense that it would be, though, right? Because to enjoy the triumph and vitality of love, you must open yourself to this other person. Open up your most fragile and delicate parts, the parts of you no one gets to see or have access to. And for love to feel as good as it does, as high as you get in that euphoria, then the aftermath of a breakup must feel equally low. It is the fall from that great height. A feeling that something has been torn out from deep inside of you. And then the question comes, who are you after the breakup, with the remnants of your partner's memories still with you? Many people feel like they have to reinvent themselves after a breakup. You dig out all the pieces of that old relationship from your foundation and you start to build yourself up again. These are the thoughts and emotions that must have been going through Frida's mind when, after ten years of marriage, her husband, Diego Rivera, declared he wanted a divorce. Frida and Diego's union was far from typical. It was messy, it was beautiful, it was painful, and it was full of mutual respect and admiration. There was no doubt that they loved each other, and that they were attracted to each other. Books have been written about their relationship, but that is beyond the scope of this episode. Here I want us to explore how Frida's relationship with Diego influenced and inspired her art. When the final divorce papers arrived, Frida was already working on an immense new painting, which was to become one of her most famous. She named it the two Fridas. It is like a double self-portrait. When seeing it, you are struck by two distinct Frida Kahlos in a seated posture facing you, holding each other's hand. Like in all her earlier self-portraits, her guarded stare locks eyes with you and doesn't let go. But the effect is now paradoxically doubled. A curious detail builds the symbolic mystery of this painting. Both of their hearts are exposed, and a single vein connects their hearts, traversing the space between them. The Frida on the right is dressed in a traditional Mexican folk style. Her short sleeve shirt is a shade of violet with golden accents outlining her neck and shoulders. Her skirt is a muted green with long frills reaching the floor, hiding her feet. This is a regional style of the Tejuana women, which Frida became famous for wearing throughout her life. She sits with her heart in full view, projected in front of her chest and shirt, as if we are perceiving a symbolic truth rather than a literal one. The Frida on our left is a mirror image of the pose we see on the right. Yet she leaps out at us visually because of her bright white Victorian dress. We see the juxtaposition of Mexican and European culture through these very deliberate wardrobe choices. Frida was half Mexican and half German, respectively from her mother and father's sides. And the image takes on a distressing quality as you begin to notice other details. Looking at the Frida on the left, you notice the lacework on her Victorian dress, and the lacework is violently torn open, revealing her ailing heart, which appears to be broken or diseased. There is blood pooling on the lap of her white dress. The source of the blood is the end of a long vein that she is holding in place with her right hand keeping it suspended in her lap with artery forceps. 
She was likely very accustomed to seeing all kinds of these surgical tools throughout her countless surgeries. As you follow the vein back to its origin, you see it goes behind her arm, over her shoulder, and back to her exposed, broken heart. It's unclear whether the forceps she is holding were just used to cut the vein, or if they are just holding it, trying to stymie the flow of the blood, a small pool of which is already collecting on her white dress. It's a visual echo of blood on a white sheet, deeply symbolic of womanhood, menstruation, or perhaps even Frida's own difficulties with being unable to have a child. So, what is going on here? The two Fridas, the stark difference in wardrobe, the dripping vein. You seem to approach something that feels like an answer when you notice a very small detail which I initially missed when first viewing and trying to understand this masterpiece. Look again at the Mexican Frida on the right. What is she holding in her left hand? A small, monochrome picture of a boy. The picture is in the shape of an oval, perhaps an echo of a womb. This small picture is an old photo of Diego Rivera as a child, which we know Frida cherished almost as if to say it is the small boy and Diego whom she loved. This little photo in her left hand is connected by a vein, which wraps itself around the Mexican Frida's left arm as it travels through the inside of her shirt and returns to her healthy and unbroken heart. The Mexican Frida on the right, holding Diego's picture, she has her whole and healthy heart, and her clothes are intact. The Victorian Frida on the left has a dripping artery where Diego once was. Her dress is ruined with bloodstains, the lacework torn apart on her chest, and a broken heart is revealed. One of her closest friends said that on days when Frida was experiencing more pain, she would make a point of wearing even more detailed and ornate dresses. Perhaps this Victorian Frida is also an echo of that. The level of symbolism and interpretation she's projecting here is unlike any other artist I know. I mean, it's deeply personal. And if we didn't know anything about the state of her relationship with Diego at this time, it might make the true meaning of the painting impenetrable to us. But I think that's the point. Frida wasn't painting this for us. If she was, she would have made the symbolism more direct. She was painting it because that's all she could do with the heartache, trying to transmute the emotional pain like a process of internal alchemy into a work of art. She was painting it out of necessity. She was painting it because she needed to figure out who she was now without her husband of ten years. When you are intimately linked with someone for that long, you begin to grow together, and your sense of self often gets wrapped up in your sense of who you are in union. After a split, your place in the world is quite literally thrown into chaos. The confusion of this state is made even more apparent by the background Frida painted behind her twin reflections. Behind them are dense storm clouds, it feels like they are in motion against the frozen-in-time appearance of her doubles in the foreground. The seeming movement of the storm clouds give a dramatic atmosphere, lending even more immediacy to the glare of Frida's doubled eyes. Which brings us to this compelling idea. There are actually three Fridas in this painting. There are the two that you see, and the one that you don't see. Imagine when Frida was sitting at her easel with her brushes and paints, gently working on the intricate lacework on that Victorian dress, and two other Fridas stared back at her. I can certainly imagine there was a moment when she stepped back to check her work, as many artists do, 
and she saw her two reflections staring back at her, forming a kind of triangle of identities, all peering into one another, as if the ones in the painting were saying, we know who we are, but who are you? Art historians tend to accept that these two Fridas are equal versions of her. But I don't know, that's not quite right. That's not the full story. It is the Frida that is doing the painting who is the one who continues to live her life. It is the Frida that is painting who goes on to define her individuality again, on her terms. It is the Frida that is painting who eventually remarries Diego. And it is the Frida that is painting who we continue to respect and admire and be inspired by many, many years later. Part 3. Visual Poetry You know, I thought about that last painting, the two Fridas, for a long time. It was in my mind for at least about two months, and I was trying to dissect all the layers of meaning, and I never really felt like I understood it. Then finally, I eventually arrived at what felt like a satisfactory explanation. And that surprised me. It usually doesn't take me that long to feel I understand a piece of art or music. Like, for example, the broken column is much more direct in its symbolism of physical pain with psychological underpinnings. But the two Fridas is like a tangle of personal, emotional, and psychological symbolism. Again, if we didn't know as much as we do about her relationship with Diego, her health struggles, and all the personal ups and downs, then much of the symbolism in her work would actually be impenetrable to us. It only confirms Frida's unique approach to symbolism. It's a key element of her work. Enough so that art critics of her time grouped her in with the Surrealists. But she was pretty open in admitting that she didn't care so much for Surrealism and that she didn't consider herself a Surrealist. She would often say that she simply painted what she saw. It becomes clear that she had a rich inner world and a keen inner eye that was able to perceive these things. But all this brings us to an interesting question that I'd like to ask you. Who are you making your creative work for? Who is your audience? Is it yourself? Is it a group of close friends? Is it a community of peers? Is it for the nation you live in? Is it for the world? Is it for a future audience? Or is it for just one specific person? It's a curious thought exercise, because as you explore it, you usually begin to realize that many of your decisions throughout your creative process are informed by the answer to this question. And you often don't even realize it. Even if you've never asked that question of yourself, who is my audience, who am I creating this for? As you explore the answer, you find out you've already answered it unconsciously. And the creative work you do has been informed by that answer and by that understanding. For example, at times in my life when I was going through a rough breakup and I was creating art, I would make personal works that I hoped my ex might eventually see. I made them both for the cathartic effect of releasing those emotions, but also because I secretly hoped my ex might stumble on them somewhere and be affected by them too. So you could say that my intended audience at those times was myself and only one other person. If the rest of the world saw the art and perhaps appreciated it for their own reasons, so be it. And it seems that the two Fridas and many of Frida's works have that flavor to them. If you get it, you get it. If not, she's not going to give you an olive branch. You may have to do some digging. People who are in her inner circle of friends or family likely know what she's referring to. The rest of us don't. Fortunately for us, the newspapers of her time loved keeping up with her life. 
so we have a historical sense of what was going on and when. Also, her husband, Diego Rivera, happened to be one of the most successful painters in the world at the time. And Frida was an avid writer of personal letters and her own journal entries. So we have a lot of records to go by and matching those up with her paintings. So please explore that question in yourself. Who is my audience? Who am I creating for? Or even a specific piece or work of art, who am I creating this for? Another strange question you can't help but explore as you read about Frida's life and those countless months spent in hospitals. Would she have still been a painter without the accident? It's a serious question, and not one I ask lightly. I'm fully aware of the lifelong consequences that resulted from that accident. I mean, she suffered depression, she became addicted to pain medication, she faced down her own mortality almost on a daily basis. Most heartbreaking of all, she wanted to be a mother. She really did. But the risk was too great. Doctors theorized that the fractures in her pelvis would not withstand the difficulties of pregnancy and childbirth. So throughout her life, it's known she had at least two or three abortions for medical reasons and at least one miscarriage. And it's known from her personal journals that she had hope for that last pregnancy. Her doctor said she might carry the child to term if they were to perform a cesarean section. But because of existing medical complications, she lost that child. And I cannot even begin to fathom how devastating that must have been. And there are a few paintings of hers that explore that heavy subject. After the miscarriage, Frida wanted to draw her lost child. She asked that the doctor bring her medical books so she can illustrate what he would have looked like. The doctor refused, saying that the hospital didn't allow patients to view medical books because the illustrations in them could be upsetting to them. She was furious. Diego told the doctor, you are not dealing with an average person. Frida will do something with it. She will do an artwork. And finally, Diego himself brought her a medical book. And on her hospital bed, she made a careful pencil study. But to return to the question, would Frida have still been a painter if not for the accident? I think so. Yes. I think in her work, you see a kind of visual poetry that could only be born from a brilliant mind. The mind of a high creative. Of course, the follow-up question then is, if she was a painter who did not so clearly wrestle with her own pain and mortality, would she still achieve the idol status that she has? Well, let's say she was a painter who didn't suffer from this traumatic accident, but because of that also didn't explore pain and mortality and wrestle with those subjects in her work. Would she still achieve the same idol status that we give her worldwide? Surely there's something to be said for how readily people connect with her art and the universality of pain as a subject. Many artists, musicians, poets, they sublimate their experiences into art in this way, and it becomes an immediate connecting point for the people who are viewing it, listening, or reading it. In the realm of music, one of uh, my first favorite songwriters that comes to mind is Kurt Cobain. Almost all of his songs involve a genuine expression of his own insecurities, personal struggles, or painful experiences. But again, just as in Frida's work, they are veiled. And to unpack them, you need to know what was going on in his life at the time it was written, or what he's referring to, to something in the past. Uh, for a great example, I really recommend listening to Nirvana's song, You Know You're Right. And ask yourself, is Kurt yelling hey or pain in the choruses? Some people hear hey, some people hear pain. I, uh, I hear both. It's very strange. The song is You Know You're Right from Nirvana. And we'll give the final words to the woman herself. 
it seems only right that she have the final say to how her story is told. Frida wrote, Since the accident changed my path and many other things, I was not permitted to fulfill the desires which the world considers normal, and nothing seemed more natural than to paint what had not been fulfilled. My paintings are the most frank expression of myself, without taking into consideration either judgments or prejudices of anyone. I have painted little and without the least desire for glory or ambition, but with the conviction that, before anything else, I want to give myself pleasure, and then, that I want to be able to earn my living with my craft. Many lives would not be enough to paint the way I would wish and all that I would like. So, we got into some heavy stuff toward the end there, but please don't let the seriousness of the topic fool you into thinking Frida was just some sad case. On the contrary, she was a woman with a joy for life and a wicked sense of humor. By all accounts, she still led a full life, with close friends, family, romantic partners, and people who adored her. One of my favorite lesser-known photographs of her is an intimate photo of her with the singer, Chavella Vargas. They are laying in the grass during what looks like a picnic, and Frida's head is resting on Chavella's chest. They're both looking back at the camera and spontaneously laughing. Frida is covering her mouth. It's widely rumored that the two of them had a love affair. It's a beautiful photo. I have it as my desktop. And I'll post that photo on my site for the podcast at mjdorian.com forward slash codex. I hope you enjoyed that journey into the mind and heart of Frida Kahlo. That one, it took me a while. I didn't want to just race through her biography and do something typical. I felt I wanted to pay my respects to her, both as an icon, but even more so as an artist, a creative human. In the process of reading her biography and even her diaries, she's honestly become one of my favorite artists. And that's surprising to me, too. Because I, I lived for so long without really knowing her art. It's reminded me to be honest in my own art. Even if the truth is complicated, life is messy. But when you are honest through your art, you create an opportunity for other people to feel what you have felt and to connect with your work because they have felt those same experiences. I also found myself really awestruck by Frida's symbolism. She has a visual language of personal symbolism that often makes people mistake her work for surrealism. To her immense credit, her inner eye was as perceptive as they come, digging up her own layers of symbolism and giving them life in her art. It's really the art historians that drop the ball on that analysis. And then in other news, I finally started a Patreon page. So if you dig this podcast and dig the music and art and content I release, please consider supporting my work on Patreon. So much time and effort goes into the various work I do, and I want to do even more. Like Frida said, many lives would not be enough to create all that I want to create. And honestly, the more budget I have to work on this podcast or my music or the art, then the more time I can spend on creating and releasing these things, hopefully for your enjoyment or benefit, and the less I will need to spend on my regular day job to pay the bills, to keep the lights on. <laughs> I'd like to eventually hire a little team to help with these things. For example, I did all the music for this episode and the other episodes, as well as the editing, recording, and mixing. In any case, if you don't support me financially, that's okay too. I still appreciate you. I, I really do. Art has no value without an audience. So thank you for your support. My Patreon page is patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash M-J Dorian. Uh, there we'll actually have a monthly art giveaway contest, which will be a new work of doily art done with my black ink style every month, once a month. 
Now, you can only participate to win through my Patreon page as a supporter. Supporting my work on any level, though. You can support it $1, $5, or $100, different tiers. And that will give you entry into the art giveaway contest every month. Beyond that, I'll also be releasing some exclusive content soon just for Patreon subscribers. So check it out. Patreon.com forward slash MJ Dorian. I hope you enjoyed this episode. In the next episode, um, I'm actually going to be doing something slightly different. It will be a conversation with a current creative mind whom I deeply respect. So keep your eyes out for that one. I'm planning to get that episode out by mid-March. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at MJ Dorian. Thank you for your support. Until next time, I'm MJ Dorian, and this has been Creative Codex. Creative Codex.